Alrighty, welcome to Roundtable Decision and Roundtable Talk on Twitch if we're live. I'm just going to make sure that all of our channels are going before I kind of start in on a uh, main introduction. Once again, I don't have the uh, side computer available for research or for reading comments. And just one second here, I'll be right back. Alrighty, so as I was saying, I don't have the computer I usually use to check for, uh, to make sure that we're all going live and that I can read the comments as they go in. So I apologize if I might miss any comments um, directly from the, the viewers. And uh, again, I really appreciate those who comment and those who are watching now or those who might watch later as you greatly help and... Uh, and just make the, the streams a lot more fun. But once again, I apologize for if I miss any of your comments or if they get a little bit delayed as I am trying to uh, catch up with them on the, using the main screen, as you can see here. Um, but I thought I would first give kind of a few quick announcements before we dive into the, to the topic of the video at hand. And the first main announcement is freedomscoop.com. So those who have watched any of my solo videos or maybe my podcast or any of the other videos on my platforms might have noticed that or that noticed that I've talked about Freedom Scoop. But basically Freedom Scoop is a group of individual content creators that make videos such as Steven Ingeramus, Ed from Ed's Ward, or used to be Ed's Ward, but now he does a contemporary every morning and has a show uh, with a co-host, uh, I believe, believe it is weekly, and we also have the generational gap, which is Monday and Friday, and then we have like the R-rated conservative and uh, Freckles and Brit show and other shows uh, relating to it. But the main goal of Freedom Scoop is basically to keep everybody's uh, interest in media from a perspective that we think is more grounded with what people believe and not just hearing the same old things from mass media sites such as CNN and Fox News because a different perspective is valid and I believe those different perspectives are a lot more credible than what we usually hear. And at least that's my reason and my main interest with being on Freedom Scoop and sharing my content. And that brings me to my next main point, which is the podcast. So I recently I made a podcast and, and it's called The Breakdown with Birkenhoff. And it's on several different platforms, as you'll see from my anchor page here, including Spotify, uh, Pocket Cast, uh Google Podcast, Breaker, and I believe Radio Public, and I'm planning to publish it elsewhere as well and get on as many audio platforms that you might listen to a podcast as possible. But as you saw from this page earlier, I'm also on Apple Podcasts, which I think is really cool, and uh, I'm really excited. And my next podcast episode is going to be tomorrow. And those that might have not have heard of my podcast as it's brand new, what I'm doing is making a live stream, sorry, a live stream of that podcast when I'm going to air on my YouTube and DLive at Roundtable Decision and my Twitch at Roundtable Talk. And then that podcast is later going to get edited just a little bit to take out like longer pauses and, and things like that. And then get published to where you might listen to your podcast such as iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts and other wherever you might listen to it and these uh, are and that's what's going to be my podcast and I also plan to make individualized episodes over certain topics such as gun rights gun issues maybe even abortion or just other sort of main topics that I think need to be talked about and as I often say most often the middle of what you hear is right so the middle of CNN and the middle of Fox is right well, whoever meets in the middle is most likely the most correct version of what's actually happened in news. So I'm trying to provide my perspective on news and politics in a way that I think is more fair, although I do have my own bias as everybody else has their bias. So I thought I would kind of quickly shout out 
those two perspectives before we dive in. And before I get into the main topic of the video, I'll quickly check the comments just to make sure I haven't missed anybody stumbling in. And I apologize that I'm going to have to bounce between tabs here, but uh, unfortunately that's just what I'm going to have to do, uh, at least for today's stream. But that also brings me to another point I quickly want to mention before we move on. And that is, I'm going to be gone for 12 days on a backpacking trip all the way till the 30th of, of this month. So I won't be making a new thing for the rest of the month after yesterday as far as podcasts go. So my podcast are, isn't going to happen the week after. Although I might, might make a smaller video to publish, but I'm not going to promise anything as of yet. So there is going to be a gap if you're following my podcast. I don't want you to think that I'm giving up or anything like that. But I mainly want to give this announcement to, to share that on my YouTube channel, Roundtable Decision, I'm going to be posting several solo videos, at least two videos I hope to publish while I'm gone through those 12 days. I've wanted a little bit more, but as I've said to Ron Helton and other members of the live stream community uh, that I've created in Freedom Scoopers and blah, 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 I basically want my content to be good. So instead of making rush type of content just to be somewhat more consistent, I more want to be consistent but have good content rather than just rushing over and over and over. So that's kind of my perspective but I am going to be gone for those days but I did want to shout out saying that although I won't be doing any live streams through those 12 days that I'm gone I'm going to have some content up on my YouTube channel so I would uh, greatly appreciate if you check out that content if you like the sort of videos I've made or solo videos that I've made in my past Alrighty, so that was the quickest I could make that introduction possible to get into the main topic and the reason that you're here on this live stream or you might watch the live stream later. Those who have followed in my YouTube community, this is the eighth live stream that I've done on my book since I've created this idea to dive in. And if you followed all the way from the first live stream where I read out the entire story to you or the entire ten and a half page prologue that I wrote and discovered my ideas from it, know that I haven't necessarily gone as far as you might think through these live streams, but the main purpose of making a weekly live stream instead of making maybe more progress in doing a live stream was to hold me accountable to at least do something. And although these eight live streams I haven't done too much and I've kind of looked back and, and I need to spend a little bit more time thinking and actually writing. It, it, it is giving a good perspective and showing me why I wanted to make these live streams in the first place. But today's live stream is going to be a lot more reading on websites than it is going to be writing and showing what I've done. I haven't really put too much to paper uh, from the last time we talked about the the book or the, the, the idea I had for the trials of Rome. But I want to dive into the physical castle layout and castle life of the royalty within the uh, the uh, Roman, or sorry, within the uh, medieval culture that ex had existed. Because I'm almost at the point to where I'm putting what I wrote on paper through when I was working, because I've worked a lot through these past days. Um, and I was just thinking of ideas, and as soon as I get an idea, I'll write it down just to kind of keep it. And if it's a little bit more of a thought out, fleshed out type of idea with, you know, more details and things like that, I'll make sure to add more details as I'm writing out. Because in general, I have good memory, but it's hard to remember everything you, ha you think of at that time, and I don't want to leave out details that I thought of that were were good and even at the time if they might not seem important they might become important later as you start to actually put uh typing it out onto the screen so i have some stuff i wrote on papers and kind of dot out my idea in my mind about how i want to go from the last time we met and that was describing the daughter character, Isabel. And then I'm going to go on and describe the, the family and the family's life type of structure a little bit more. 
But then I'm going to go on to describe the castle itself and the castle rich culture that the royalties might have lived back in the medieval times. And it's very important that I give those transitions between that part of the story to the next part of the story and be very good. But I want to describe this castle in vivid detail, but not super, super vivid, that it drowns out the awe of what I want to describe this castle as looking. And as I've also said, I want the castle to look historically accurate, but at the same time, maybe be a little more beefed up than what castles were 100% were in the past. But in general, I've always said that the biggest thing in history is Basically, uh, how do I phrase it? You can't make history better than it is, I guess is a way to describe it. And I kind of approach it like most of the time what's actually happened in history is greater than what you can create in your mind. And I kind of think that that's the same way with the castles. Although you have your Disney type of castles that are very large and just super, 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 super... Um, non-doable in those times and and at such a massive scale that it doesn't even make much sense if you think about it it's magical it's fantasy it's something you can can imagine and not necessarily be 100 percent true and although it has its pluses i don't think that that's necessarily the route i want to go with my castles and before i dive into this first article i'm going to make sure i haven't missed anyone's comments just to see Alrighty, we're looking good. So this brings me to my first point. And in general, I've been doing some Google searches and listening to some videos from Chad and uh, Chad Adversity on YouTube and other things. But I mainly want, as I've just said, my castle to look historic, but to still have a bigger aspect to what castles were like and castles were back in those times. And the video is going to be very heavy on research based. And I just put medieval castle drawings or medieval castles. And if you look on uh, Google Images and such, you'll kind of see some of the type of castle structures and drawings that have been given. With some drawings like this that look a little more historic and a little more maybe accurate compared to the castle here that looks a little bit more Disney-like. And I was just going to show some of these castles and I've kind of thought about how I want to describe. And my main castle that I'm basing off of this part of the story is Dover Castle. And the Dover Castle was an actual historic castle that is based on a hill. And outside of this hill is a body of water. And their body of water was controlled through the navy of the, what this castle had. And it was in, on a strategically high point. And the castle, uh, in a large part, still exist today. And has stood the test of time. But the biggest thing I have to do when describing a castle and showing what actually, uh, what would you say, exist in a castle are what rooms you, you think of when you think of a castle. Because especially with Disney and other aspects, when you think of a castle, you tend to think of the throne room and maybe the sleeping quarters of the king and queen. And although every castle did have these, these obviously weren't just the only rooms that existed. So you can go on several of these websites uh, about castle layouts and what castles might have looked like and see some of the results. So I just did a Google image, as you can see here, on my uh, screen. But essentially, this was a very basic, and this is the first image on uh, Google Images, about what a basically a simple castle might have looked like. And you see that it has a tower, it has a bakehouse, has a courtyard, has a dam, has a kitchen, has several moats, has an outer court, has stables. And that was an interesting thing that I didn't necessarily... No, to be 100% true till I did I think the second live stream on my YouTube channel that there were actually stables within castle walls and I didn't necessarily, necessarily know that but it makes sense from a medieval perspective for there to be stables within the castle walls 
because if there were to be an attack on this castle you wouldn't want all your stables to be outside the castle walls because obviously it would be very easy to kill the, your horses and by killing your horses in this example you would you would lose your advantage you might have of uh, medieval warfare with horses compared to just on ground and on foot but these stables also included more than uh, just that but then you got your your layouts that are more detailed uh, uh, perspective of what castles look like and you have such as this Harold Harlan castle I believe it's called and just several other castles and you, a lot of times when you search castles on Google you'll get your Minecraft castles because that I think that was a big surge of what a lot of people like to build in Minecraft were castles and these castles when they would get fully crafted looked pretty cool and uh, I think people in general are just very interested in castles as a art form and because it is something that is magical even just by itself compared to what movies and other people make them out to be but that brings me to this article and John if he's listening to the stream now or maybe later might look at some of this uh, stuff uh, and think that it could be wrong as it's not exactly the most reliable website by the looks of it but I've read through a lot of it and I'm not going to read everything because there is a lot of writing if you're uh, watching now but uh, anyway I was going to read some of it because I do think that it gives a relatively detailed perspective of what each room of a castle might have included and the layout of a castle from that but I'll check these comments real quick And hello, Ron. I see you on uh, YouTube now. Thanks for uh, hopping in. So I'm going to go to uh, read this some of this article out. So it says it. Uh, it says the Great Hall. <laughs> the Great Hall is the main room of a royal palace, nobleman's castle, or large manor house in the Middle Ages, and in the country houses of the 16th and early 17th centuries. Great halls were found, especially in France, England, and Scotland, but similar rooms were also found in some other European countries. In the medieval period, the room would simply have been referred to as hall, unless the building also had a secondary hall, but the term great hall has been predominant for surviving rooms of this type for several centuries to distinguish them from a different type of hall found in the post-medieval houses. A typical great hall was a rectangular room, one and a half and three times as long as it was wide, and also higher than it was wide. It was entered through a screen passage at one end, and had windows on one of the long sides, often including a large, <clears throat> a large bay window. There were often a Min minstrel's gal gallery above the screen passage at the other end of the hall. <clears throat> the Lord's family, more private rooms, lay beyond the dais at the end of the hall, and a kitchen, buttery, and pantry were on the opposite side of the screen passage. Even the royal and noble residents had a few living rooms in the Middle Ages, and the great hall was a multifunctional room it was used for receiving guests, and it was the place where the household would dine together, including the lord of the house, his gentlemen, attendees, and at least some of the servants. At night, some members of the household might sleep on the floor of the great hall. From time to time, it might also serve as the lord's courtroom. The great hall would often have one of the larger fireplaces of the palace minor house or castle frequently large enough to walk and stand inside it it was used for warmth and also for some of the cooking although for larger structures a medieval kitchen would customarily lie on a lower level for bulk for the bulk of cooking commonly the fireplace would have an elaborate over mantle with stone or wood carvings or even plaster work which might contain coats of arms her relic modus usually in Latin.
<clears throat> Many great halls survive. Two very large surviving royal halls are West Minor Hall and the Winds Windcrestleys Hall in in Prague Castle. England has a little altered 14th century example, surviving 16th century and early 17th century species means in England. Wells in Scotland are numerous, for example those at Longleat, England and Burgley House, England. <coughs> Bedchambers. The room in the castle called the Lord and Lady's Chamber or the Great Chamber was intended for use as a bedroom and used by the lord and lady of the castle. It also afforded some privacy for the noble family of the castle. This type of chamber was originally a petitioned room which was added at the end of the great hall. The lord's and lady's chamber were subsequently situated on the upper floor when it was called the solar. The lord and lady's personal attendees were fortunate to stay with their master and mistress in their separate sleeping quarters. However, they slept on the floor wrapped in a blanket, but at least on the floor. They would also absorb some of the warmth of the fireplace, even during the warmest months of the year. The castle retained a cool dampness, and all residents spent as much time as possible enjoying the outdoors. At the times, Mimmer wrapped the blankets around himself to keep warm while at work. <clears throat> Want to check one thing real quick? Alrighty, looking good. Alright. <clears throat> the solar. The room in the castle called the solar was intended for sleeping in private quarters and used by the Lord's family. It became a private sitting room <clears throat> favored by the family. The solar suit of rooms was extended to include a wardrobe. The solar was a room in many English and French medieval manor houses. Great houses and castles. In such houses, a need was felt for more privacy to be enjoyed by the head of the household, and especially by the senior woman of the household. The solar was a room for the particular benefit in which they could be alone or sole, and away from the hustle, bustle, noise, and smells of the great hall. The solar was generally smaller than the great hall because it was not expected to accommodate so many people. But it was a room of comfort and status, and it usually included a fireplace and often decorative woodwork or tapestries wall hangings. In the minor houses of western France, the solar was sometimes a separate tower or pavilion away from the ground floor hall and upper hall, great hall, to provide more privacy to the frugal lord and his family. <clears throat> Bathrooms, lavatories, and whatever. <laughs> Bathrooms are so common in the classical world. This disappeared in the medieval Europe, except in monasteries. Except in certain circumstances, baths were not required for ordinary people until Victorian times. Cleanliness was fundamentally ungodly. Baths were taken in transport wooden tubes in a summer sun, could warm the water and the bather. The tub would be moved inside when the weather worsened. Privacy was ensured with a tent or canopy. In English, a garter bore has come to a mean of building, usually a sample hole discharging to the outside. Such toilets were often placed inside a small chamber, leading by association to the use of the term. I'm not even sure how to say the garter obes, garden obes. Technically, garden homes were small rooms or large cupboards, closets, in which the latter was located. These closets were often used for storing valuables. A description of the whatever at the Dogwell Castle indicates that during this time when the castle in use it believed that ammonia was a disinfectant and that the visitors' coats and cloaks were kept in there. I'll check comments real quick. Alrighty, looking good. Kitchen, pantries, lar larders, and ba butteries. In most households, including early castles, cooking was done in an open hearth in the middle of the main living area. To make efficient use of the heat, that was the most common arrangement for most of the Middle Ages. So the kitchen was combined with the dining hall. Towards the late Middle Ages, a separate kitchen area began to evolve. 
the first step was to move the fireplace towards the walls of the main hall. The later, late, and later to build a separate building or wing that contained a dedicated kitchen area, often separated from the main building by a covered arcade. <laughs> the way the smoke arteries and bustle of the kitchen could be kept out of sight of guests, and the free fire risk to the main building reduced. Many basic variations of cooking utensils available today, such as frying pans, pots, kettles, and waffle irons, already existed in great households. Other tools more specific to cooking over an open fire were split of various sizes, and the material for for screwing anything from delicate quails to whole oxen. There were also cranes for the adjustable hooks so that the pot cauldrons could easily be swung away from the fire to keep them from burning or boiling over. Utensils were often held directly over the fire or placed into embers or tripods. Those were also assorted knives, staring spoons, ladies and or la- ladies, ladles and garters in wealthy households. One of the most common tools was the mortar and sieve cloth, since many medieval recipes call for the food to be finely chopped, minced, bashed, strained, and seasoned either before or after cooking. This was based on the belief among physicians that the finer are the consistency of food, the more effectively the body would absorb the the nourishment. It also gave skilled cooks the opportunity to externally strap Sorry, to elaborately shape the results. Fire texture foods was also associated with wealth. For example, finely milled flour was expensive. While the bread commoners were typically brown and coarse, a typical procedure was farming from the Latin farcio to cram, to skin, to skin and dress an animal, grind up the meat, and mix it with spices and other ingredients and then return it to its own skin or mold it to the shape of a completely different animal. Pantry. <clears throat> a pantry is a room where food pr- provisions or dishes are stored in an ex- capacity to the kitchen. I don't think we really need to read much on the pantry. Mm-mm. Larder. A larder is a cool area for storing food prior to use. Ladders were commonplace in houses before widespread use of the refrigerator. Essential qualities of a ladder are that it should be as cool as possible, close to food preparation area, constructed as to include flies and vermin, easy to keep clean, and equipped with shovels and cupboards appropriate to the food being stored. In the northern Hampshire, most houses would, ar- would arrange to have their ladder in the kitchen on the north or east side of the house where it received least sun. Many larders have small unglazed windows with the windows opening covered in fine mesh that allows for free circulation of air without allowing flies to enter. Many larders have tilted or painted walls to simplify cleaning. Other ladders, and especially those in larger houses, have hooks in the ceiling or hang joints of meat or game. Others have insulted containers for ice. <clears throat> gatehouse. The gatehouse is a fortified structure built over the gateway to city or castle. The modern gatehouse is a feature of the European castles manor houses, and mansions. Gatehouses had made their first appearance in the early antiquity when it became necessary to protect the main entrance to a castle or town. Over time, they evolved into very complicated structures with many lines of defense. Strongly fortified gatehouses would normally include a drawbridge, one or more Arrow loops and possibly even murder holes where stones would be dropped on attackers in the late Middle Ages. Some of these arrow loops might have been converted into gun loops or gun ports. Sometimes a gatehouse formed part of a town fortification, perhaps defending the passage of the bridge as a river or moat, as Bonomo Bridge in Monmouth, York, has four important gatehouses known as bars in its city walls. The French term for gatehouse is logis porche. This is could be 
large complex structure that served both as a gateway and lodging, or it could have been composed of a gateway of an enclosing wall. Chapels. Ooh, that is a loud mother sound. Anyway, chapels. Throughout the medieval period, Christianity of the form... Uh, let's repeat. Throughout the medieval period, Christianity of the form currently in power was obligatory with the internet, internet, intermediate expansion of Jews. Almost everyone was obliged to pro progress Christian beliefs and to act accordingly. Only the most powerful nobles like Frederick II were able to express disbelief without risking their lives. The room in the castle called the chapel was intended for prayer and used by all members of the castle household. It was usually close to the great hall. It was often built two stories high with the nave, div with the nave divided horizontally. The Lord's family and the district sat in the upper part and used the servants occupied the lower part of the chapel. Alrighty, let's make sure. And then Ron says, I have never heard of that before. Solar room. Nice to learn something new every day. Yeah, that's a... Uh, uh, I haven't heard of that really either before I read it the, the first time and read it now. Uh, but as you said, you know, it's pretty cool to uh, learn something new every day. I think we all uh, like to do that. That's part of why I love making these type of videos. And especially with this novel series. Because I'm learning a whole bunch of stuff when trying to write this book. And really trying to write this chapter. As it's taking a very long time. But I knew it would. So it wasn't like I'm too shocked. But I would have liked to have gotten more done so far. But I can only... Uh, do as much as uh, my mind is creative to do, if that makes any sense. I think we're going to move on from this article as it talks about a little... Uh, uh, a couple of other topics of hand that are relating to castles, but they're not exactly relating to the castles that I want to do. They're more later and more advanced type of castle work. So uh, I'll I'll move on and go to this next one. Oh, that's unfortunate. Hmm. Oh, well, one of the sites I was going to talk about wants me to use. Uh, or wants me to uh, not ad block them. So I don't think I'm going to be using their site anymore, unfortunately. That is one thing I don't really like to do. I think we all uh, know that, especially uh, Ron probably would, would think the same thing. And thank you, uh, Bomb Live, for donating a lemon. Just saw that. You're the best. Mm -mm. Alrighty, so let's get going here. Medieval castle layout, the different rooms and areas of a typical castle. And this is from exploringcastles.com. As it says, what was a typical medieval castle layout? Well, there isn't a carbon copy plan that was rolled out across Europe. Castle layouts depended upon local demands and the purpose of the function of each castle. Excuse me. For example, a castle built on the turbulent borders of England and Wales might have been built to as strong as defense as possible. Alternatively, castles in a more peaceful, prominent part of southern England may have been designed to cultural and air of luxury and magnificence for the local lord or lady. However, many medieval castles shared similar features. Defense, barricades, and deep moats with the kitchen and the great hall and a keep or dungeon at their heart. This was the plan of the York Castle which shows many of the key elements. Medieval castle layout of Fur Furley Hungerford Castle. So let's look at the layout of an excellent example of medieval castle. Although it's not a typical, totally perfect example, I struggle to find a perfect one, it is still a typical dem demonstration of the conventions and features of a medieval castle layout. First and foremost, a grand residence for the Hungford family. However, the design of the castle still included many defense elements such as towers, a barbican, a gatehouse, and a moat. It did play a small part in the English Civil War. 
Here's an example of a castle today from Google Earth. As you can see, it is now quite ruined in indeed. It sadly fell into disrepair in the 1700s. So if you kind of zoom into this Google image here, it obviously kind of shows uh, the castle, and this is from a little farther up, but uh, you can see that basically there is no height to the castle anymore, as it's more just based on a ground level, and that's kind of what he was talking about, but that's not the main point of what we're uh, talking about here. So the keep. The keep was tr traditionally the heart of any medieval castle layout. It usually the tallest and strongest castle situated at the heart of heart of the fortifications. In medieval times, they would have used the term keep. Instead, they would have called this tower the dungeon from the French indicating stronghold or dungeon. It's not dungeon, but anyway, because this is too easily confused with dungeon. Oh, <laughs> that's funny. I always avoid using this phrase to keep. Well, the keep was traditionally the strongest and most fortified part of the castle. In the early medieval times, it's where the nobles would have would have lived. In later medieval times, the castle began to morph into grand residential buildings from being fortresses. The nobles began to live in warmer, comfier chambers, and the keep became a stronghold. The moat and the dam. Very few castles had the advantage of fresh flowing natural moat formed from the loop of a river, for example. Instead, moats needed to be man-made by, by damming nearby rivers and streams to create a stagnant pool around the castle. Although moats were great for defense, they partially prevented attackers from bowing beneath the castle walls, for example. A stagnant moat would have been pretty unpleasant. Sewage would have been tipped straight into the stagnant water. Imagine the smell in the summer. The adjacent image, which you can see in the castle, was from one of the most impressive moated castles of the whole UK. And I'm clicking on this link real quick to show you this castle. Uh, where? Right here. So it's, yeah, some of the images it's using uh, from that castle with the, how large the, the moat was. But I don't necessarily think that my castle is going to have a moat. Or at least this castle that I'm wanting to describe is going to have a moat. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that. But as we go on. The kitchen. The kitchen would have been a frantic hub of activity. Entertaining important guests was a fundamental purpose of many castles. This helped secure the power of the castle lord and the lady. The size of the castle kitchen was often proportionate to the ended grandeur and importance of the castle. The most elaborate kitchens would have been all set to cook and prepare game and fish, which had been caught when hunting in the castle grounds. The Bakehouse and Brewery Bread was a dietary staple, so it should be not be a surprise that many castles had their own bakehouses, which would have baked fresh bread for everyone living within. Many castles had their own breweries. This wasn't due to medieval alcohol dependence. Brewing beer circulated, highly polluted, pollu highly polluted water, making it much safer drink than sipping water alone. In fact, beer was so important in medieval life that a designed alley wife, yes, she was always a woman, would have been in charge of the castle brewery. All right, so let's check comments real quick here. And then Ron says, yes, I can imagine sanitation was pretty non-existent. Phew, be right back. I have to put my hens to bed. Yeah, I'm not I'm not going to be, be able to go too much longer because uh, dinner is just ready now. So I, and I have to eat. And I'm pretty hungry as I'm doing this just after I got back from work. I literally just took off my work shirt and put on this one. Uh, but I didn't want to wait too much too much longer to do uh, this live stream because they do want to eat and check out uh, Matt Christensen's call-in channel because I do like to listen to that occasionally. I was kind of wanting to do that today also. So I don't know if I'll necessarily uh, uh, be here by the time you get back, Ron. But again, I appreciate you stopping by. But I just felt like I, I wanted to do the stream and kind of give you an update and again to keep me accountable for at least thinking about this book uh, a couple times a week. 
Although round towers castle were prominently decorative, many other castles built towers for practical purposes to avoid a vantage point for archers to shoot at on oncoming attackers. But real quick before I move on, that was a f- fun thing about hygiene in the uh, first place about medieval castles or anything uh, like that. Because especially nowadays, we view hygiene as being a, such a high importance. But back then, they didn't really necessarily have access to all the things we have access to uh, for today, uh, in today's time. And But it's just a, a interesting concept that hygiene was uh, from now to then. It's something that it's almost even hard to think about of uh, being such a radical difference. Additionally, the advantage of round towers is that they could be toppled over that easily, or that they couldn't. Attackers had got wise to that fact, the fact that by barreling under the corner of a square tower, they would disrupt the foundations and collapse the whole tower. Round towers didn't, of course, have any corners. Perfect. The stables. Horses were incredibly valuable commodities in medieval society, essential for transport, communication, and for use in battle. Indeed, for a lord to be considered powerful, they would have needed war horses. Stables would have often included high lofts and space for grooms to live. Archaeologists working on Fribla Castle have been indeed discovered evidence for sizable hay lofts within the castle, the gatehouse. Every castle suffered a huge corundrum. People and supplies needed access to the castle, but building a route into the castle formed an incredibly obvious route for attackers. It took castle designers a surprisingly long time to solve this problem. The solution they came up with, came up came upon was the gatehouse. The gatehouse was a fortified entrance with numerous different doors and poultrices, tricks and obstacles all used to guard the castle. It wasn't uncommon to see two different gatehouses, one on the outer castle and one on the inner, if the outer one was breached. A later solution, again, was the drawbridge. In actual fact, a chain drawbridge as we think of it today was an uncommon feature of a typical medieval castle layout. These designs tended to to be added in later years. Later years. Instead, many castles used a pivoted system where the blank for a drawbridge was fixed on a ledge between two moats, like a big seesaw. The photo you see, well, we're not going to go to that photo yet, but the barbarian. The bar, the bar, barbarian. <laughs> I don't know why I can't read. Anyway, funneled attackers through an obstacle course riddled with Jane danger. Was a further development in defense castles, the design of the castle. Whether the gatehouse simply protected the entrance to the castle, the barbican was designed to be definitely obstacle course, preventing attackers from even reaching the gatehouse. The barbican was a thin, enclosed passageway that would have jolted out of the gatehouse. Attackers would have to stream through this thin tunnel just to reach the gatehouse. Sneakily, the defendants of the castle could fill the, the barbican with deadly traps, slits for arrows, and holes for boiling oil. This meant that the only way to get in a great house was through an entrance riddled with danger. The inner courtyard. This would have been an area of hustle and bustle as the focus of the day of residential life in the castle. Whereas horses and pigs would have been gazed in other courtyards, it's likely the inner courtyard would have been used for more formal events. I'll check here real quick. Alrighty. The dungeons. Most castles didn't have dungeons in actual fact. Dungeons are a bit of a modern day obsession. However, it's it's something I've asked about, so I've written a special page on castle dungeons. In early medieval times, castles didn't really have dungeons simply because the idea of keeping someone prisoner was back then a very strange punishment. However, as the Middle Ages developed, more castles became equipped with spaces for prisoners. From this modern dungeon developed secure places to hold prisoners and enemies of the castle. And that is something I'm going to change within my castle. <laughs> One of the key things I'm going to develop with the castle I'm, de- I'm going to make in my story 
is that I'm going to have Catherine, one of the main characters in the story, be walking through a dungeon at the end of this chapter. So I am going to have a dungeon in my castle. But as I was just telling Ron earlier, I more wanted to just update you with kind of the information I've been reading in the past couple of weeks and added to my research document that I've showed my YouTube uh, live streamers before. But I'm going to put this all into paper, and and I'm not. And as I mentioned earlier, and at the top of this video, I am going to be gone for 12 days. But through those 12 days of me backpacking out in the wilderness, I might be able to think of some more ideas. Uh, about my story as I'm not going to have to to access to work and going to be uh, out in the wilderness so I might inspire some more creative type of thinking compared to just being um, being at work and being at the house so that might be something that leads to getting more done over those 12 days than I've gotten done in the past but I also wanted to quickly mention again that I'm going to be doing my podcast tomorrow. I'm thinking probably midday, maybe anywhere from 10 to 12 t central time uh, is kind of my target time of when I'm going to start the podcast. And uh, we'll go from there while I'm, and talk about there. I hope that uh, you all enjoyed this video. I know it's somewhat shorter than the ones in the past have been. But I didn't really have too much from last week, so and I didn't want to just keep blabbering on about nothing. But I did want to update you on some of the research I've done behind on the book. But before I leave, I'll check the comments, make sure I haven't missed anybody. And uh, thank you again, Ron, for jumping in. And uh, I'll catch you on my next uh, live stream, maybe the podcast tomorrow. But whenever, I'll see you in the next time, and hope uh, you have a